in you? Really You're oh, 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 oh. Hey. Oh. Why don't you pick on somebody your own size? Oh, yeah? <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> These guys are certifiable. <laughs> I never seen a comic again. It wasn't a nickel call away from a loony bin. Oh, come on, yo. Being that I've covered a lot of Three Stooges media on this channel, some admirable and some not so much. Well, 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 I'm not a stooge, and neither are you. I've often been asked to look back at the Three Stooges TV biopic from 2000. The movie, which premiered on ABC, was produced by longtime Three Stooges fanatic Mel Gibson. Yeah. You heard right, Mel Gibson. It first aired on April 24th, 2000, and was watched by over 10 million people. After that, it seemed to quietly disappear for a couple of years, before it started reappearing on cable, where it reached a lot more people. It finally got a DVD release a few years ago, represented by a really lackluster box art, and it's also currently available on most streaming services. I'll never forget when this movie originally aired, though. I was only eight years old at the time, but as a huge Three Stooges fan, I couldn't wait to see it. Enchanted! Enraptured! Embalmed! I actually have the original TV guides that promoted the movie that I collected at the time. He collects them. <laughs> you collect TV guide? They were how I actually learned about the Three Stooges as people, as they included a lot of really great bios and facts that I otherwise wouldn't have had the opportunity to read. I always remember how this movie brought a lot more attention to the Three Stooges, especially amongst kids my own age, as this movie was heavily promoted at the time. And it seemed to lead to renewed interest in the Stooges, as afterwards AMC began airing the shorts every weekend with host Leslie Nielsen. Well, the midterms are right around the corner at NYUK, so today, class, I would like to review some of the sound effects utilized by the Three Stooges. The eye poke. <gasps> Plucking strings on a ukulele. The stomach punch. <laughs> Kettle drum. A face slap. <laughs> it's a whip crack. For that, I'll always be grateful for this movie. When I got older and began to research the Three Stooges more, I started to realize how this movie really stretches the truth at times, though. I know most biopics have to exaggerate the truth to better mold real events into a more movie narrative, and while some of these exaggerations really aid the movie, others are just bizarrely misplaced. <laughs> but there is a lot of good in this movie as well, and I want to examine all of it, the fact and the fiction, to clear up some inaccuracies and highlight what works about a movie that really helped renew interest in the Three Stooges. Come in. Come in. Come in. Come, Come in. First, let's start with the good. The source material is a really great book by Michael Fleming. In it, he chronicles every Three Stooges short, and even includes a smacks and pokes count for each. I obsessed over this book as a young comedy fan, and it still makes for a great companion piece when watching the original shorts. It's lovingly researched and provides a lot of great insight into the history of the Three Stooges. In turn, the movie feels lovingly made as a result. Oh, I can't see! I can't see! What's, What's the matter? matter? I got my eyes closed. Oh, oh, oh! Listen, oh. you! See this? Oh! There are a lot of biopics about comedians made prior to this that over-sensationalize tensions and drama, making the movies feel less like biographies and more like hit pieces. Boy. Eddie, this one's the best. The Three Stooges is a biopic that is made with affection, though, and I really appreciate that. The most memorable scenes in the movie come when they recreate full segments from the original Three Stooges shorts. The guys do a good job at playing the Stooges as well. Unlike the reboot from 2012, a lot of what the guys here are doing had to be pretty accurate recreations, rather than new material in the same vein. No! Oh, oh, darling! Darling! Colonel, this is Mrs. Dodge, my wife. Whoa! Oh, Colonel! Oh. Of the main cast, Michael Chiklis is the clear standout. 
He perfectly captures both the boyish charm and troubled soul of Jerry Curly Howard. Do you know what swearing means? No, Judgy Wudgy, but I know all the words. Cut print, yes. Take five, everybody. You may be the brains of the ACMO, but he's the heart. John Kassir makes for an entertaining shemp as well. <laughs> me, 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 me. Even if the movie chooses to portray him as being way more wimpy than he actually was. Shemp is definitely the hardest stooge to mimic, and Kassir recreates his mannerisms well. I didn't mean it. Love taps. Love taps. Works. Hey, look, fancy footwork. Uh oh. Evan Handler does a decent job as Larry Fine, though I don't think that the screenwriters knew how to really give him a place in the story beyond just being there. Somebody pinch me. Oh, not there. Larry was a really complex performer, but he takes kind of a back seat here as the focus is more on Mo and his brothers. Say, Mo, just because you're older than me doesn't give you the right to boss me around. It ain't like in the pictures, you know. Oh, for crying out loud, babe, would you quit whining? You know, I'm just trying to help you, that's all. For me, the one performance that doesn't work, oddly enough, is Paul Ben Victor as Mo. Look, Mo is also really hard to imitate. And Paul already had a heavy bag to carry, with Mo being the main focus of the story. But something about his characterization as Mo Howard, the person, just comes across as a little too gruff for me. I'm talking about respect. Respect, Harry. For 20 years you and Comey treat us like second class citizens. Everything you dished out, we took it, and we stayed loyal to you. And then what do we get? Hmm? The old heave hole. The story is broken up into two timelines. One that follows the Stooges' career from vaudeville to their comeback in the 60s, and the other being the bookend segments, which feature an older Mo coming to grips with the losses of his career and remembering his past in flashbacks. A lot of the transitions to and from these flashbacks are just pretty awkward and lazily done. There's one scene in particular where Mo gazes at a photo of he, Ted Healy, and his brother Shemp which for some reason is in the office of the head of Columbia Pictures, it just doesn't make much sense. To Paul's credit, I think a lot of his performance suffers due to how the story paints Mo, misrepresenting his real-life personality with traits that were more akin to the Mo character he played in the shorts. Enough! Guys, I'm trying to sleep. Cut it out, both of you. Would you stop it? Would you cut it out? I'm warning you both. Babe, I'm warning you, would you choose to stop it? <laughs> Although he was a loudmouth bully on camera, the real Mo Howard was a soft-spoken, very introspective guy, who loved talking to fans about the Stooges. Now you see by the weight of the pie, right. depends on what part of the palm you're holding. Like you take it from here, wham, right in the push. Now. You take this one here, this is what they call the Royal Show. The He's Royal Show. The Royal Show, you give it... Bang! The movie paints Mo as being much more cynical than he really was. Have you ever died, kid? Not that I can remember, no. No? Well, I have. In Philly, Seattle, Cleveland, nobody laughed. That's right. And it's a lousy feeling when nobody laughs. As in these bookend segments, he just wants to distance himself from the Stooges and is now working as an errand boy for a studio head, even getting his lunch and waxing his car for him. Which wasn't really ever the case. Mo actually sold real estate when he wasn't acting, and as a result, he was probably the wealthiest of the Stooges. So the movie painting him as kind of a studio errand boy, desperate for work, just doesn't make much sense. It's a bizarre choice that doesn't aid the story in my opinion. It just would have been far more interesting and optimistic to follow Mo being passionate about the future of the Stooges, rather than just bitter and angry and resentful. Just trying to let you see how much I'd like for you to bug off. Now beat it! And yes, that's a young Joel Edgerton as the executive trying to lure Mo back to performing again. Another bizarre facet of this movie was that it was shot entirely in Sydney, Australia. And excluding the four main Stooges, nearly all of the cast are Australia or New Zealand-based actors. 
including not only the Stooges' wives, but also the other Stooges, like Joe Besser and Curly Joe. Ah, not so hard! <laughs> Crazy! And to their credit, a lot of them hide it very well. Especially Ted Healy's actor. They sing, la 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 la, dance, <laughs> do female impersonations, <laughs> even acrobatics. In fact, they are the best act of this kind in the nation. Very truly yours. Who wrote this? I did. Producer Mel Gibson explained the reasoning behind this at the time, saying, With the Australian dollar depressed at the moment, you get more bang for the American buck. And surrounding the sound stages in Sydney, there are several areas that lend themselves very well to another era. A timeless place with lots of texture, it's a location you've never seen before. Well, that's mostly BS, as aside from a couple of beach scenes, they don't really take advantage of the location. The movie was shot there for pure budgetary purposes, as the production budget wasn't very high to begin with, and the movie had to be shot quickly. Which leads to what I feel hurt this movie the most. It crams the entire history of the Three Stooges into just 87 minutes. That's 35 years in under an hour and a half. The beginning of the movie moves along at a decent enough pace, following the group's formation up until Curly's decline. But then when the one hour mark hits, the plot accelerates to ludicrous speed, leaving no room for scenes to breathe. Curly suffers a stroke, Shemp rejoins the act, Shemp dies, Joe Besser joins the Stooges, Joe Dorita is introduced, the Three Stooges stage their comeback, and credits roll, all in just 20 minutes. Remind me to murder you later. I'll make a note of it. Yeah, you do that. Shemp's second tenure with the Stooges is one of the most important times of the act, as they really started trying new, crazy things during that time, such as 3D shorts. Yeah, that's right, there's no bats here. Yeah. I always- oh! yeah. uh -huh. What a hideous, monstrous face! Oh. Here, all nine of those years are showcased with a single scene, showing the production of Shemp's first short back. And then, just minutes later, we're at his funeral, where it's also announced to the audience that Curly had died years prior. His death, which follows that of younger brother Jerome Curly Howard in 1952, comes as the latest blow to the comedy team led by surviving brother Mo Howard and partner Larry Fine. It would have been so much more compelling to see more of Larry and Mo dealing with the loss of Curly and then Shemp, rather than just a single funeral scene to honor both of them. Again, I know biopics have to take some creative liberties to move the story in a more conventional pace, and I'm actually forgiving of a lot of them here. But then there are others that are almost derogatory in their existence, such as Joe Besser's soul scene, where he's painted to be a complete jerk. I don't care what my line is. Cut. Joe, this shot is the punchline. I understand. Good. Uh, we'll pick it up, roll the camera. But I am not taking a pie in the face. All right, we'll get it in the morning. That's a wrap. While it is true that Besser preferred not to get hit, he was never so vicious about it. And later in life, he always spoke very highly of Mo and Larry. Because I never expected to ever be with the Stooges. But it was one of the most beautiful two years that I could remember in show business. We had more fun, more... Uh, laughter amongst ourselves that made the pictures that we did a happy one. Some of these creative liberties just end up hurting the pace in the long run. The bookend segments with older Mo serve no real purpose and are mostly inaccurate. Trimming these out and telling the story in a more linear fashion might have aided the pace and allowed for more breathing room and time to explore the true history more. But despite all of this, I think the movie is well-intentioned, and it does do a lot right, even if it is flawed. It was a huge step in renewing interest in the franchise as a new millennium dawned. And it would even lead to the Farrelly brothers beginning their decade-long journey to make their own Three Stooges movie. Watching this movie for this review, I was brought back to being an eight-year-old kid again, sitting in front of my TV on Monday night, watching this big premiere. If you're looking for a fun introduction to who the Three Stooges were, 
then this biopic is a great first step in learning about these guys. It might take some liberties along the way, but its heart is in the right place. If nothing else, I guarantee that it will put a smile on your face, and hopefully make you appreciate the Three Stooges that much more. <laughs> oh! 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 Oh!